In the previous video we have discussed probability sampling techniques and in this video we are going to discuss non-probability sampling techniques. And as I have already mentioned to you, if you are studying business administration or marketing, you are most likely going to end up with these non-probability sampling techniques. So let's go for them. First of all, we need to decide about our sample size. In the previous video, when we have discussed uh, probability sampling techniques, there were very exact rules of how to determine our sample size. Now with non-probability sampling techniques, it is not that strict and not that straightforward. There are just some recommendations about your sample size. So for instance, the first recommendation regards whether your population is homogeneous or heterogeneous. Now, if your population is homogeneous, then your sample size should be at least 4 to 12 cases. If your sample size is heterogeneous, your sample size should be at least 12 to 30 cases. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's say that you are researching uh, franchise companies and you decide that your population is just all of the franchise companies within your country. This can presume that your population is homogeneous, meaning that your sample size should be at least 4 to 12 cases. If you decide that your population is, let's say, the whole world, then of course your population is going to be heterogeneous and that means that you need to increase your sample size and it should be at least 12 to 30 cases. Second recommendation regards your research strategy. The more complex research strategy you have, the larger sample size you need. So for instance, if you go for these really complex research strategy, such as ethnographic or a grounded theory, your sample sizes are really increasing. In case of ethnographic study, your sample size should be at least 35 to 36 cases. And when you are going for a grounded theory, your sample size should be at least 20 to 35 cases. If you are going for a more simple research strategy, such as case study, then you can go for lower uh, sample sizes, such as 5, 10 or 12 cases. And now, final recommendation when it comes to sample size under non-probability sampling techniques is what we call a data saturation. And that basically means that you are uh, starting with a sample size of maybe 5 or 10 according to the previously mentioned recommendations. So our basic sample size is 5. Now we will be increasing our sample size and we'll be maybe interviewing more and more companies until the point when interviewing next company will bring us nothing new. That means that we have reached this data saturation level, which is satisfactory. So maybe we would be researching 6, 1, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then after, after interviewing 10 companies, we would realize, well, it seems like this last company told us nothing new. So let's try one more and we will see. And then the next one, well, they told us nothing new meaning that we have saturated the data that are in the field and we can stop here and our sample size is going to be 12 and that's all. Now let's go ahead and discuss these concrete non-probability sampling techniques. First of all, we are going to go for what we call a quota sampling. With quota sampling, you need to create what we call quotas. Now, this is a bit of tricky process. First of all, you go to national demographic data and you create the quotas that are relevant for you. There are many ways how the population can be demographically stratified. So you need to create stratification relevant for you. Let's say that previous research suggests that there might be differences between genders, age groups, and as well occupancy. So you will take male-female stratification, then each of these is divided into three age groups, and then each of them is divided whether they are employed or not. From national demographic data, you find out number of people in each of these groups that belong here. This is sort of 100% for you. If your sample should be, let's say, 1% of the whole population, now you use a bit of math and calculate 1% 
from each of these groups and those will be your quotas. Now you will be collecting the data the way that you need to fill in these quotas, ensuring that your sample is really good and the result from it will be generalizable to the whole population. So you see the idea of quotas is quite simple. You simply create them and then thanks to it, you know how many people from each of these groups you need to involve in your research. This is a very often used sampling techniques, especially for political opinion polls. So you see it quite often in TV. But let's go for the next option of our sampling technique. The next option is what we call a purposive sampling. And this is simply you are using your own judgment to select a cases which will really help you to answer your research questions. Meaning, for instance, that you will purposely select cases that are especially informative for you. I think you can very well imagine that the purpose of sampling, you need to justify the selection of a case because uh, it goes against these basic rules of academic world or it goes completely against the rules that we have discussed previously under probability sampling techniques when you were using random numbers to ensure that that every case has equal probability to end up within uh, your sample. Now you are doing exact opposite. You are using your own judgment to select these cases. So you need to justify why have you selected these cases within your sample. But still, we have some options or subcategories when it comes to purposive sampling. So let's go through them. First of all, we have extreme case sampling. Here, you will focus on unusual or deviant cases that occur. The presumption is that by examining extreme cases, you will be better able to understand typical cases. Then we have heterogeneous sampling. In this case, you try to get as much variation within your sample. So what you do is that you define one key variable or characteristic. Then you select your cases so that the key characteristic varies as much as possible. Then on the other hand, we have homogeneous sampling. This is the exact opposite. You again have your key variable or key characteristic defined, but you select cases that differ just very little from each other. What will happen is that you will be actually studying some subgroup of population. This may be based on occupational level or something like that. Then we have critical case sampling. I think you can imagine it. Uh, let's say that you were studying some market failure. Within this market failure, 100 companies failed. You will select the ones that failed the most or the ones that were influenced the most by this market failure so that then you can generalize as to what will happen with less critical cases. On the other hand, we have typical case sampling. This is the exact opposite again. If there was this market failure with 100 failing companies, you would rather choose this average so that you can define and generalize typical failure that occurred. Now we are moving to next sampling technique, which is volunteer sampling. And we have two options here. We can go for a snowball sampling or self-selection sampling. So let's go for snowball sampling first. Well, this is used in a, a cases when it is very hard to reach these entities or these cases that you would like to involve in your research. So for instance, uh, example would be that you are researching companies that have already failed in particular market. And uh, the fact that they failed, meaning that they will not, you will not be able to find them maybe on the internet or, or in some databases because they already failed. So it's very hard to reach these companies. So what you will do is that you will try to identify maybe one or two of these cases on your own, even though it's so hard, you can hopefully get to them. And now you will ask these uh, cases or these entrepreneurs who have failed to recommend for you your next cases, to use their own context to get 
you to the next cases that you can involve in your sample. That's why it is called a snowball sampling, so that each of these cases is going to recommend someone who you should research next and next, and so your sample size or your sample is getting bigger as a snowball. Now we are moving to self-selection sampling, and this is a very often used sampling technique even though uh, students do not often realize it. Because what students often do is that they create some sort of questionnaire which they want uh, to get answers from people. Now what they do is that they post it on Facebook. Now some people will decide to answer this questionnaire. You know, this is the self-selection. People will decide themselves if they want to get involved in the research. So uh, be careful if you do this, if you make a questionnaire and post it on Facebook, you are actually going for a self-selection sampling. Now our final option of a non-probability sampling technique is what we call a haphazard sampling. And I really do not recommend going here because the only justification for selecting your case is that you select cases that are available and reachable for you. And you know, stating this in your research, saying that, well, I have selected these 10 cases because I had the phone numbers for them, well, that's not really the best thing to do. So try to avoid haphazard sampling because the only idea of this sampling technique is that you go for cases that are available for you. So as you see, we went through all of our options when it comes to non-probability sampling techniques, and I hope that you were able to select the one that will suit you well.